Good local time, everybody. Um, my name is Justin Ratcliffe, and um, we're going to be doing this uh, presentation um, around kind of avoiding your own jungle of the commercial software supply chain. Uh, it's a riff, essentially, on Upton Sinclair's book, uh, The Jungle. Um, we're not going to be talking about meatpacking plants. Uh, that's not the <laughs> discussion we're going to be having. We're going to apply the same kind of concepts and the metaphor to our own supply chain, the ones that we produce and the ones that we consume um, through commercial services. Uh, so a little bit about who I am. Uh, so I work for Fidelity Investments. Uh, I kind of handle all their open source stuff. I lead up their open source program office. Uh, I'm the kind of main point of contact for Linux Foundation and the To Do Group, which is all the open source program office leads. Um, internally, it's really just being that the advocate for doing cool things in open source um, at Fidelity. Uh, and that could be we want to use it, we want to patch it, we want to contribute it, um, we want to work with a supplier who depends on it, which is pretty much all of them. Uh, so I tend to be fairly busy. And uh, but it's it's fun stuff. Um, and just because this is a global event, uh, I am in Cary, North Carolina, which is part of the Research Triangle Park, uh, just as a little geolocation. Um, so why does this matter to me? Um, and we all know that open source is in everything. We've all seen all the surveys, um, all the information, all the stuff is gathered. Um, I did a little video. I didn't write this app. Somebody else's. Um, but I, it's going to kind of go through React Native, uh, just an NPM that uh, many of us may have used, we may use internally, uh, we may kind of watch. Um, and uh, yeah, I just want you to just kind of see why. And I think a visual really just kind of helps. So I'm selecting out React Native. And what it's doing is it's walking through every single module that NPM is pulling out. Um, so this is the kind of normal speed uh, of the thing. Um, I realized though that this was going a little slow. Um, so I actually had to accelerate time. It's gonna pop in right around now. Um, and what's happening is again, every single link, every single module is being connected um, and potentially creating another edge. And you can see, wow, so I just included one, React Native. And all of a sudden, my software supply chain looks like this. Um, that's a little complicated. So that's it. Uh, so almost 600 packages were needed. Uh, they're linked a thousand times and that's all the people who are responsible in contributing to making React Native a reality so that I can use it. Um, yikes, it's not necessarily bad. They're all doing really, really cool stuff, but it's pretty complicated. And that's both what we absorb um, when we write our own software, but also what, what also uh, contributes to some, some areas of risk when we source somebody else's software. Uh, so the kind of the narrative is, is really figuring out uh, what are people doing? Do they care about their bill of materials? Do they have concerns around this? Are all those modules really needed? Um, and, and what does it mean to, to uh, quote unquote, um, operate locally, um, eat locally, and really understand what my supply chain means to me. So um, this is a quote from the jungle. I'm not gonna read it out loud. Um, but again, this, this idea that uh, we're, we're getting a product and it's a fine product, probably was put in a can, may have a nice label on it. Um, that's awesome. Uh, now that if you kind of apply this beyond the, the concept of food, um, this could be an endpoint from a cloud service provider. This could be a commercial distribution. This could be a commercial uh, of open source. It could be a commercial product um, that's both proprietary and open source. 
Uh, but if you don't know what's inside it, well, how do you know it's good for you? Um, how do you know it's not been doctored? And again, this was a problem that the book was written to, to kind of resolve and to, to wrestle with. And it caused a whole lot of changes when we look at food quality uh, for the United States. And it's kind of a turning point when we, we look at um, what is it, what's the responsibility for the social good and keeping people healthy? And what's the responsibility for the, the producer? Um, because they can't, they don't have an infinite budget. People are only willing to spend so much. Um, but it's important to kind of wrestle with these, these kind of questions. So uh, kind of like I mentioned before, um, people use open source, no shocker. Uh, so again, this comes from the to-do group. Um, I don't look like I need to refresh it to the 2020. Um, but when we look at the ratios, uh, and this is only so that people were willing to admit. For those who had already been taking the survey, they felt comfortable talking about it. Um, honestly, I feel like most uh, products, commercial or commercial distributions of open source, they include open source. Uh, it's a big part of what we do today. And so those numbers, I actually probably think are a little bit low. Um, and when we have to take this as kind of a, an end-to-end -end thing, well, if that amount of open source is sitting in our commercial product, or is sitting at the other side of an endpoint for a software as a service product. Um, and we're giving them their our data for them to protect. Well, other people's supply chain matters as well. And life comes at you fast. Um, there's always something new. Um, again, before we used to source things from some big commercial supplier. That could be any name brand that you know, Cisco, Microsoft, whatever the case may be. Um, it's not that those are bad, uh, but the world is very different. And oftentimes those same suppliers are contributing to open source projects. Um, and it's not that those closed source projects were without bugs or errors, um, but oftentimes we, we kind of trusted. The brand came with some credibility. Uh, Fidelity Investments is very brand, uh, brand centric. Um, you come to us as a, as a broker, as someone who, who, who will make a trade or manage your retirement. Um, those are really important things. Those are long lasting things. Um, and it's that trust that, that's there in the brand. Uh, with an open source project, it's harder to draw that bright line. And uh, there could be a number of reasons why that project could have problems. And again, Companies can have problems, uh, it happens all the time, but how do we make ourselves aware of those things? So, what can be done? Um, I think one of the kind of the basic things is basic education. Talk to your developers about it. Um, make it kind of part of their curriculum. Oftentimes they're required to take some basic security. Well, tie in some light and license, tie in some open source lifecycle. Um, if we know that they're going to be 60, 70, 80, 90 percent of their code base is going to be open source, uh, well, let's make sure they understand what they're getting and how they're getting it. Uh, they don't need to be an expert. Uh, we have application security teams uh, for a reason. We have open source program offices for a reason. This allows, again, some of those, those uh, policy type questions things that are really down in the weeds. What does a Faro GPL mean to me kind of things? Well, that's not the responsibility of every developer. It'd be really expensive. It would take a lot of their time. But there's some basic operations of, of dealing in an open source world that actually can be uh, educated. It can be part of that portfolio so that as they're developing that application, they can go in it with, with eyes open. Um, if they see a license and they know that this is for a mobile app, well, that's a distribution. I have to keep, a, keep an eye out for the GPL. It doesn't mean you can't use it, but there might be other things that we as an organization need to do if, if we do. So let's try to figure that out. Um, you can be a, an advocate 
for tools and practices that make sense, um, for stuff that, that generates a level of ownership and accountability, giving developers options, telling a developer, hey, you can only choose uh, this color or this front end web dev framework probably is not gonna end up well. Um, it's gonna be a little bit of a demotivator and well, they're probably gonna get a bit of shadow IT going um, because this is a fast moving environment. We're always being incented to take a look at alternatives um, and different technology. And there's some good to that. And we wanna be able to foster that as organizations, but there's also some risk to it. So we have to be able to measure that. Um, so tools and processes, especially like with a React Native example, you can't be policing 600 dependencies that probably are changing every day. Um, that's not a scalable thing for a person to do. Tools can do it really, really well though. Um, and we need to be the, the advocate to take that, put tools uh, in the appropriate locations, and then get that data to developers along with some education to help them kind of distill that and say, what does this mean to me? Um, not just gates, not just hard policies, but really understanding what those motivations are. Why does this matter in this case, but maybe not in this case? Um, inviting the developers to the conversation can be really, really important. And this is also part of engaging with commercial suppliers. So when you ask them for, for a bill of materials, or what is their practice around open source governance, they don't have an answer. Well, it's not a bad thing. Some people have just not thought about it. Uh, but being curious can actually really help them. They may actually have something, but you may be talking with a salesperson or a legal person, uh, and they have to bring in a subject matter expert. Uh, those are important conversations to have. And again, being that advocate, advocate for tools and practices, even in our commercial supply chains, very valuable because oftentimes everybody's looking at the bottom line, whether it's products you're writing or products you're purchasing. So if, if customers are not asking for a capability or an artifact or something along those lines, you're probably not going to get it. Um, in this case, if more people ask for it, it'll become normalized, um, kind of like wearing masks. Uh, we're, we're figuring this thing out together. Um, and then engaging in the, in the sustainability integrity of our own supply chain. So caring about it, investing your talent, investing your dollars, um, not just asking the questions um, to our commercial suppliers, but potentially uh, writing upstream patches, helping to again, move those ecosystems forward. Um, it's really, really in interesting and, and fun stuff. So, um, we need to, basically, we need to expect more. Uh, we need to look at it and say, hey, we can't just trust what it's on the shelf. It's not that it's bad. We can give it a little bit of trust, um, but it's, it's still a little bit wild west there. Um, there is no USDA of software. There's no one making sure this stuff is good. Even with all the flaws of, of, uh, of the USDA checks and being able to time them and the, the overhead, um, it's not a perfect system, but it is a system. And it helps most of the time, uh, us in the States, to eat food safely. Uh, we can rely on it. We don't have that for software, um, especially when we get beyond legal and, and copyright related stuff, uh, security best practices or maintenance best, best practices. There's a lot of best practices, not a lot of policies or regulations. Um, so being able to say what is good is a lot more complex. So uh, here's some specifics. I'm going to kind of uh, run through them, um, kind of four points that I think can make a big difference in, in avoiding uh, essentially bad stuff making into our own supply chains, whether from things that we buy or things we pull in from GitHub or NPM. Um, so knowing your bill of materials. Uh, it seems to be kind of an obvious one, but oftentimes uh, teams overlook it. Maybe they just look at their direct dependencies. Even if they have it, they may avoid uh, doing transitive work. And again, maybe back in the day uh, when you had five or 10 or 15 dependencies and they were kind of big, just call them Java, 
um, maybe that was a, a feasible way of approaching this. Um, but now we have these heavily inter interrelated ecosystems like Node and NPM that understanding your real bill of materials, not just the surface stuff, gets complicated. Again, as we saw in React Native. Um, quality ingredients. Um, so a little bit of the food theme again, but um, buying things that you can trust. Um, and then how do you trust things? Uh, what are characteristics of the things that you do trust? Uh, those can be hard questions. Is it just because you find it on a store shelf that it, you should apply some trust to it? Maybe, um, but there's some other options there. Uh, organizational preferences, I think is one that, that uh, so smaller organizations can get by with. Um, but as you get into bigger organizations, Fidelity has a wide breadth of developers. We have those who are still responsible for our mainframe, those who are still writing COBOL. Um, and then we have those who are re responsible for our mobile apps. Um, both have equal responsibilities to security and compliance and all that kind of good stuff. Their needs are really different though, based around the ecosystems that they deal with and the velocity of change in those ecosystems. So, being able to, to apply some context into understanding your supply chain can really make a difference to your developers. Um, because what, what works for a mobile, uh, a mobile developer probably won't work for a mainframe developer. Um, and recognizing that, make sure the policies and practices reflect that. They're not overly biased in one direction, um, but just making sure that organizationally, we can, we can figure it out and then mine that data um, to, to help the next set of developers. Uh, and then again, investing upstream. So software bill of materials. Um, this is uh, a little bit complicated. Um, there's a couple specifications out there. Uh, I put a couple of them on there. So you have FPDX. Uh, so that's the Linux Foundation's uh, primary one. Uh, there's also Cyclone DX, a little lighter weight. Uh, I'm finding uh, some organizations are adopting that as opposed to SPDX. Um, not gonna get into specification wars. Uh, the, the goal is that it's machine readable though. Um, you don't want the back of the cocktail napkin kind of ingredients list. You want something that it should be somewhat reliable and it's been created by an automated tool. And if you ever looked at either of those schemas, you're not gonna write those by hand. Um, so being able to adopt uh, a bill of, material, bill of materials schema that uh, is machine readable, but can still be converted to something human readable, um, it's super important. And it becomes a, a, what they're intended to be, an exchange. I could have a supplier give me that and say, hey, yeah, these are all my ingredients. Um, and I should be able to trust it a little bit. Um, one thing to always remember though, is these bills of materials are, are generated by sometimes open source, sometimes proprietary code bases. Uh, they're all built around heuristics um, and it could be natural language processing or um, uh, kind of fragment analysis and tokenization and all this kind of fun parsing stuff that's somewhere in the back of my head uh, from the days of writing software, but um, they're, they're in some ways proprietary. And everybody might come up with something a little bit different, which is why you, you need that kind of normalized or neutral schema to hand it off to somebody else. Um, there's a couple, plenty of open source options. I put a couple there. So Pathology, uh, it's Linux Foundation project. Um, NextP scan code, very popular project out there. Um, certain organizations will use something like the OWASP dependency check, and dependency track projects heavily kind of uh, core in, in the Java world, but, but doing a lot more than that lately. Um, and then there's also any number of commercial en uh, entities getting into this space. Uh, they all realize that static analysis for security and dynamic analysis for security, when it was 100% proprietary code, maybe that made sense. Um, but now with open source, composition analysis um, is, is a kind of a key part of your, of your pipeline. Um, because what you do with those findings is a little bit different. They may become a, a CVE. It may be 
something that uh, is publicly registered with the government um, and possibly has an answer it says hey just update um, those are, are important parts that we can take uh, take part of um, we also have platform capabilities so a couple github and gitlab both have, have kind of accepted that dependency analysis um, should be an should be, should be a platform capability. You can use those dependent that dependency graph to feed any number of other types of systems. A security system. Do you have any CVEs for this dependency? Um, it could be a licensing system. Or if this is a distributable artifact, do you have GPL code in it? And does that create a concern? Uh, or it could be a maintenance type of concern. Is this project being maintained? Um, and being able to surface the, those kind of indicators um, can be very valuable to a developer, but they're all based around that core bill of material. Um, so when we're thinking about the, the bill of materials, a uh, lot of concerns you have to bring in. Um, one is declared versus observed, uh, and then we get into licensing in that way. So a lot of projects will say, hey, this is a license that I'm under. But then if you look at its dependencies, so that transitive dependency chain, well, really? Um, if you're including GPL, but you're declaring that you're Apache, that doesn't work. Um, so what can we do about that? Well, you may not be able to resolve that yourself. That may take some upstream work. Um, but you have to be able to surface those things. And that's a great role of a tool. Um, and then when we think about end of life, technology lifecycle management, um, how do we get this type of data available to our developers? Because if it isn't broke, oftentimes we don't fix it. Um, and then if it does break, and well, you haven't fixed it for, or you haven't maintained it for a decade, that could be a lot more complex of a fix. Uh, we like to get our oil changes done regularly, even if the engine doesn't seize. Um, so we have to be able to kind of get ahead of that stuff and, and keep to a regular cadence. And a lot of that will all be built around a bill of materials. Um, and again, this may sound like it only matters to software that we're writing, but feel free to talk to your, to your commercial suppliers. Um, some of them will put their third party notices or attribution notice or um, some form of disclosure uh, on their website to say, hey, these are the open source work that we depend on, possibly even the version that they depend on. Um, so you can use those, but ask, can you, prov pro uh, excuse me, can you provide me a software bill of material? Because if they can, and they can do it on a, a pretty rapid pace, probably they have a good process and practice in place. They know what's inside their code base, they may have policies built off that bill of materials. So it becomes a, a strong indicator that they're aware of what's going into their products. Um, if they look at you and kind of go, no clue. Um, well, it doesn't mean there's a problem. Again, you could be talking to the wrong person, but it is something that's not necessarily intuitive to them. And it may be a growth area. Um, that's something that, uh, an area of risk that they weren't aware of before, and you're helping make them more aware of the criticality, because you're going to be giving them some sort of data. Um, that could be very minor, a query um, for maybe public data, um, we'll say a stock ticker or something like that, um, or it could be personally identifiable information, PII, so being in the regulated space. That matters a lot. Um, so being able to surface that is, is really important. And uh, helping organizations know you're not out there to, to uh, nitpick their software development lifecycle. What you're there is to say, hey, I'm giving you potentially the keys to the kingdom, uh, something that re represents my brand. And I want to make sure you'll care for it, that you'll protect it, um, and that you understand all the things that go into it. Because oftentimes they're very comfortable with doing this for uh, their subcontractors, uh, maybe a geography type of check um, for any kind of procurement. We don't think of it for software, uh, but it does matter. And you're also seeing a lot of work in the industry standard space. So OpenChain, again, another Linux Foundation project, 
uh, they're going to be an ISO uh, standard shortly, if not done by the time this, uh, this airs. And um, that's really important. It gives us all a place to look and say, okay, that's consistent. Um, we can all kind of rotate towards that from our practices. And while it's really focused around the legal compliance, um, it provides us a framework for discussion. Because um, again, ingredients are what's in the mix. Speaking of ingredients, um, so I'm gonna call out to a friend. Um, everybody likes Link. Um, I know, I like Link. Um, maybe I'm dating myself a little bit. Um, but um, for a more recent game, um, yeah, we all remember if you played uh, Breath of the Wild, um, you couldn't just slam any ingredients together and get a good product. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this didn't poison you, but yeah, it wasn't what you were looking for. You, you hopefully were looking for this one. Um, and um, we all remember where you had to go in and get the ingredients for that. Um, but in general, uh, we have to care about where the, where the ingredients come from. Uh, we see this a lot in the eating local. So you'll have now restaurants saying, hey, we're a local based restaurant. That means they're just sourcing ingredients from the places around them. Um, and why would you do that? And a lot of it comes down to the freshness, but it's again, that trust concern again. When you can go and see and you can visit uh, a farm and you can look at the practices or you can look at the animals, you can look at the produce, um, you're gonna feel more confident that what you're getting is good. Um, it isn't something that you're way separated from. Um, so being able to apply those things to software is complicated. Um, because especially when we look at open source, one of its strengths is that it's borderless, um, that we have so many uh, individual users, organizations, foundations, all contributing to create something common and awesome. So throwing the easy one up there on Kubernetes, um, we should feel proud there's 20, almost uh, 2,500 plus people um, that have contributed to this. And those are the only ones that are recorded on GitHub. All those behind the, the shadows um, are not listed. And that's awesome. We should all be very, very proud of that. Um, so when we think of it in the context of an ingredient, um, is the community active? Well, obviously, we have so many people playing on it. We have so many pull requests coming in to saying, hey, this is a fix, or this is some, something new. Um, and that engagement is very high. Well, there's a lot of issues. Um, how many were closed though? What's that mean time to close? All of those you can look at and you can start kind of pulling out and saying, okay, well, this is, this is a community that's vibrant, um, that I can in some ways depend on in my supply chain. Um, I can't name a specific uh, developer and say, because of them, this project is good. It's not a brand name type of thing, but we can look at the characteristics of the community and decide that, hey, this looks awesome. Um, a couple of projects that are kind of in this space, um, and again, they're related, so chaos, um, the uh, health and um, characters in health and open source, uh, and attributes of open source software. Sorry, I can believe butchered that. Um, the sub foundation that we look at the health of communities. And this isn't just looking at, hey, I have an open source work, and I need to maintain this work and I need to build a community around it. Um, but it can also be around, hey, I'm gonna use this open source work. Um, take those same characteristics, those same attributes and apply them at almost like a risk lens and say, is this a vibrant thing? Can I depend on this community? Um, and Augur is one of the projects that's partially maintained by the Chaos Foundation. Um, to help kind of pull that data out. So it'll go out and it'll look at GitHub, it'll aggregate this data and help you make some decisions. Um, this is also an emerging area of, of uh, in the commercial space where you have maintenance of open source works becoming far more critical um, because uh, the, the first generation of open source uh, passed a long time ago. So we may have adopted some Apache project um, from early 2000s, and that's great. 
because it saved us from, from buying a commercial product. But because that project is not broken, we may still be using it. Um, and it may be in the Apache attic. Well, how can we surface that? How can we make that available to the developers and help nudge them potentially to an alternative? So again, this is the organizational preferences. Um, I tend to kind of call this the Amazon shopping cart experience. Um, a lot of people are very familiar with Amazon, so it makes for a good metaphor. Um, but it's a little bit of an abstract concept. What you're looking at is metadata. You have this giant storefront, this giant warehouse full of stuff. Um, we don't know what's good. And a lot of the stuff looks exactly the same. Uh, I throw a spatula on here just because it's fun. Um, and that spatula is, is awesome by itself, but there's thousands of spatulas in Amazon. Well, which one's good? Uh, which one's going to meet my needs? And some of that becomes from what we see. And we can see things like star ratings. We can see that there's people answering questions. We can see there's a badge that says Amazon's choice. Um, and those are all indicators to us that, hey, this is probably a pretty good spatula. It probably will meet my needs. I don't know what the cost is, uh, but maybe this is the one that I should get. Um, and some of this is, is organic, um, but some of it is definitely not. Um, Amazon has a lot of smart people and they're trying to steer you and that's okay. Um, and we can do that along the lines with, with what comes up in our software builds and materials. Uh, we want to help our organizations adopt similar products, generate a little bit of consistency because if, hey, we're going to work upstream on a project, well, it'd be great to have more people work on fewer projects because we'll be able to materially influence them rather than spreading it out and not really being able to move the needle on any project. Um, but we also need to be able to, to help people not, uh, not buy what's uh, directly on the menu. So you might be an Angular shop and that's great. It's still an awesome project, very well maintained. Um, but your developers may come to you and say, hey, I wanna try React or Vue or Svelte. Um, okay, well, we're an Angular shop. Um, all of our knowledge, all of our experience may be there, but we shouldn't necessarily be kind of single-minded. Uh, single How do we allow our developers a little bit of freedom? Have them take some accountability, because there's some risk. Um, if you now have a def defect in, in React um, and all of a sudden it goes back to an Angular developer, that's probably not gonna work out well. Um, but if we aren't aware of these things, we'll probably miss emerging concepts. We'll not be able to stay up. We'll increase our technical debt. Um, so you have to find this balance um, in exposing this type of data around who's using what, how effective was it? Um, how supported do they feel? And can they help support use? Can be really, really powerful. So a lot of times it's building a taxonomy, building topics, and allowing for, for organic communities to grow. Um, centers of excellence can be, let's say, a, a formal way of creating this, um, but oftentimes those are, are almost a lagging. Um, they can't really catch those emerging concepts, um, whereas a tagging taxonomy can't. Um, where you're gonna, if people are subscribed to front end web dev and all of a sudden they start seeing topics on view, well, okay, well maybe I should pay attention to this. Um, and again, that goal is really to reduce the amount of, of variety um, and focus. Uh, that allows us as businesses, as well as from our suppliers, to maximize those relationships. Uh, it's an econ a basic economy is a scale. Investing upstream. Um, so this is one that I think a lot of organizations are still trying to figure out, mine included. Um, this is maybe the most comfortable, at least at Fidelity, uh, budget, dollars. Um, we can allocate those things to foundations. We can do it on events, uh, through an all things open, just happened uh, last week. Uh, for me and uh, here in, in Raleigh or ideally in Raleigh. Um, we can sponsor events. 
Um, we can uh, work with partners like uh, I put in Tidelift and GitHub sponsors, which really start getting at, hey, how do we how do we help support a specific project or a specific domain of projects? Um, all of those things take money. So this just helps you direct it. Um, and there's some, some benefits there. Uh, because when we think about uh, investment in some of these kind of core platforms, it, it generates talent, it gets our brand out there. Um, hopefully folks will be interested in coming and talking to us about a job, um, as well as it helps to stabilize potentially commercial distributions or cloud service provider endpoints that we source. Um, that's important uh, because we're all depending on those at some point. Time. Um, so I think this was actually probably from the Kubernetes project as well. Um, but we can just have our, our development associates spend, mon uh, spend their time fixing bugs, um, handling issues, just being generally engaged. Uh, they can do that in something like GitHub issues. They can do it in Stack Overflow. Um, they can be focused on documentation. Um, that's a, a challenge for every, every group out there. And it isn't just your README. It could be a quick start, it could be an in-depth motivational thing, it could be an architectural decision point. Um, any of those little document artifacts become super valuable to the next generation, um, as well as those who wanna learn from the project. So taking our resources and investing that time um, can really make a difference. And again, this bubbles up, it flows from these open source projects back into our commercial supply chain. So if we open a patch and, and fix a bug or a public CVE on an open source work, well, we're probably not the only ones using that open source work. We probably have suppliers that are using that open source work and they didn't have that time. So that bubbles up into their code base and helps to protect their code base, which is protecting our data. Um, so again, there's a lot of these uh, cascading benefits that we can talk about, we can wrestle with. And then code. Um, so again, the most obvious one for source code um, is open those pull requests. Um, those could be bug fixes, it could be enhancements, um, but working upstream rather than almost creating something new, sometimes it can be hard for organizations because they want that, that control and that, that brand awareness. Um, but having all the organizations work on fewer projects can be beneficial. Um, now again, it doesn't come without any risk. We're always gonna be looking and making sure that project is the right one. It's going in a good direction. So neutral governance and all that other kind of fun stuff. Um, forks are a way to handle that. Um, but being able to, to create freedom in your development talent to work upstream on the actual source code uh, can make a big difference. So here's some kind of next steps. Um, so this stuff sounds all great and everything like that, but how does it fit? Where does it fit in my world? Um, so when you're coming up with your product review documents or maybe you're working with your procurement team, make sure open source supply chain is a question you ask. Um, and be willing to listen and to learn and to adapt how to answer and, and respond to that question. Um, and also when you're creating products, um, within reason, be able to talk about what your supply chain is. Um, if you wanna put a third party notices out there, that's great. Uh, in some ways, radical transparency, that, that's an effective, uh, an effective light uh, to shine light and say, okay, yeah, we don't want these bugs. Um, but on request is, is good as well. You're not legally required um, in, in many circumstances, especially as software as a service to providing this type of notice, but community, it's a good thing. Um, and it may help you. It may, people may make you aware of a concern that you were maybe not seeing. Uh, engaging communities of interest. So being involved in the things that matter to you. So if you're a big Kubernetes shop, and honestly, who, would, who doesn't have it on their radar right now, making sure your, your talent is also attending in special interest groups or working groups or user groups, um, 
maybe not leading them day one, but at least listening, getting exposed to alternative opinions. How are people solving a problem? Um, do, is this a good problem to have? Or uh, potentially is it an anti-pattern? One of my favorites is always kind of multi-cluster management for Kubernetes. Uh, everybody's got an opinion there. Um, and you want to be able to hear those. Because you're, you're going to land somewhere in that, in that decision spectrum. Um, so having a number of people be able to kind of talk about that problem, um, potentially even writing code or writing documentation. Um, those who have tried to do it and maybe not had success, super valuable. Uh, make your developer experience first class. Um, this isn't just about tools. It's not just about GitHubs or IDs or anything along those lines. But when developers are, are there and they're trying to do their day to day, do they feel supported? Um, do they feel respected? Um, are they given information so that they can make decisions themselves, um, that they can take on risk and document that motivation? Or are they just putting in lines of code? Um, so really thinking through that developer experience and, and trying to empower them, not, it's not anarchy, um, but empower them to make good decisions. Um, build that accountability and that trust inside your organization. Um, and when we get to, to questions, um, I'm always up for suggestions on this stuff. Um, I think it's an interesting topic for us all to be really wrestling with when we think about supply chains. So um, just talk about it. Uh, those could be on Medium posts, it could be wherever, LinkedIn, whatever your, your platform of choice is, uh, but really thinking through all the ingredients that go into the software that we write and the software that we use um, in trying to generate something that we can all trust. And I'll leave you with a quote. Um, so this was, again, this is PBS's Poison Squad talking about the, the situation. Um, that spawned Upton Sinclair's book. Um, but we all look at things and we see this is awesome. You can't go to GitHub and not be in awe of what so many people have created in, in a common place. Um, and it's not perfect, but seeing just such great stuff coming out of it in this generation. Um, but we need to care. We still need to, to wonder what's inside because uh, it isn't necessarily good for us. Um, so feel free to ask those questions, stay curious, and um, you'll make it better for everyone. Thanks. Have a great day.